Welcome to Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. You're just moments away from a live endoscopic ultrasonography and endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. Dr. Jerry Evans will perform these procedures under a single sedation, as Drs. John Bailey and Garish Mishra will moderate. The procedures will utilize an endoscope to examine the lining of the walls of the upper and lower digestive tracts, as well as diagnose and treat problems involving the bile ducts, gallbladder, and pancreas. OR Live makes it easy for you to learn more. Just click on the Request Information button on your webcast screen and open the door to informed medical care. Now, let's join the doctors. Good afternoon. My name is Garish Mishra, and this is my colleague, Dr. John Bailey. Thank you, Garish. I'm pleased to be here. <clears throat> Dr. Mishra is our director of endoscopy and also director of our endoscopic ultrasound program here at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center. Uh, Garish uh, did his training uh, is in gastroenterology in Gainesville in Florida and then spent uh, time at uh, the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston learning this very specialized technique of endoscopic ultrasound. And you've been here, what, now, seven years? Uh, yes, John. Thank you. Uh, and if you haven't uh, gathered by the accent, uh, uh, Professor Bailey originally hails from Scotland and is an international expert in pancreatic disorders as well as the procedure we're going to do uh, ERCP, which is endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. Uh, and uh, so today uh, is a very uh, unique day, special day, in that we're going to have a wonderful case uh, of a woman uh, in her middle age who presented several weeks ago with uh, increased liver enzymes, um, slightly jaundice, meaning yellow. And uh, at the outside facility, she had an attempt at ERCP, uh, a procedure that allows us to visualize uh, and actually gain access to the bile duct. Unfortunately, the gastroenterologists were unable to gain access to her uh, bile duct, uh, and therefore she uh, presents uh, to us here today. And we'll go through this case in detail in terms of why we do the procedure uh, and what it offers uh, for the patient. Uh, uh, so what <clears throat> I'm going to show uh, is a, uh, switch over to a PowerPoint um, schematic here is the pancreas, and you can see uh, this entire organ here is the pancreas, and the procedures that we're going to show today, the endoscopic ultrasound and ERCP, are used to better visualize this area, and the bile duct would be in this area. So uh, we'll now show the procedure, and my colleague, Dr. Jason Conway, uh, is an assistant professor uh, of internal medicine and gastroenterology and a, uh, has done special training in endoscopic ultrasound, trained, uh, did an extra year of special training at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. Yes. Okay. Um, so he's uh, getting ready to uh, put the scope uh, into the patient's mouth and esophagus uh, down into the stomach uh, to get a better uh, visualization of the pancreas and bile duct. I might mention that we do many of our procedures uh, with the support of our anesthesia providers, either under general anesthesia or under what we call MAC, which is monitored anesthesia care. Uh, and that allows us to do a lot more because the patients are, are truly asleep. And often we combine the endoscopic ultrasound and the ERCP tests. I think it's fair to say that a common complaint we have from patients who come having had these procedures attempted elsewhere is that they wake up in the middle of the procedure. And that's part of the problem with so-called conscious or moderate sedation, that it's hard to keep people asleep for long periods with that kind of uh, sedation. So it's one of the advantages I think we have here, uh, Garish at, at Baptist, that uh, we can really get the people asleep and that allows us to do things when they're not moving and we're really aiming at a very small target here. So let's go back over and see uh, what Dr. Conway is doing. That's an excellent point, John. Uh, the ability to do intricate uh, movement uh, really depends on uh, the patient being very comfortable and adequately sedated and we're very fortunate to have our uh, anesthesiologists uh, pretty much throughout the day uh, to uh, tackle all our uh, procedures and challenges uh, that, that we face in the uh, endoscopy unit. 
We might uh, just take a few moments and talk about what we might expect to see here. <clears throat> you know, patients uh, get jaundiced uh, for a whole lot of different reasons. Uh, and one of the things that makes managing liver and bile duct disease interesting is, is working out uh, where the abnormality is. And there are certain things that point us to mechanical obstruction of the bile duct. The bile duct is a tube that runs from the liver into the intestine a few inches beyond the stomach and it empties through a little nipple that we call the papilla or the ampulla. And we can visualize that system with a variety of imaging ranging from ultrasound to CT scans to MRI scans. So before we ever get to the stage of doing the kind of specialized procedures we're doing today, we have a fairly good idea what the plumbing looks like. And if the bile duct is enlarged or what we call dilated, it's a little smoking gun, a little red flag that maybe there's a mechanical obstruction to flow of bile. So what kind of things would we think of as obstructing uh, the bile duct? Uh, the commonest uh, is stones. Uh, gallstones are extremely common. Uh, it's a disease mainly of Western countries. So in the US we have a lot of it. Over half a million people a year have their gallbladders out in this country for stone disease. And about 10 to 15 percent of them will have a stone or stones in the bile duct at the time of their surgery. You can also form stones after gallbladder surgery. And I think I'm right, Garish, in saying this lady's had a gallbladder out in the past. Correct. So just the fact that you've had your gallbladder out doesn't mean that you can't have stones. You either can have a stone that perhaps slipped into the the bile duct at the time of the surgery, or if it's years later, you may just make a whole lot of new stone material junk in your bile duct. So we certainly think about stones. Depending on the age of the patient, we also think about tumors, and malignancy is a lot of our work. Uh, that little nipple or ampulla that the bile empties out uh, can become obstructed with tumors. Uh, the commonest tumor we see is a tumor of the, the head of the pancreas. The bile duct runs down through uh, the front part of the pancreas, what we call the head of the pancreas, and, and if we go to the um, PowerPoint presentation, uh, Garish can show you how we look at this with endoscopic ultrasound. So if we could flip over for a moment, Garish will just tell us what he does if he has the EUS scope and we, we see a mass in the pancreas. Uh, thank you, John. That was uh, very uh, nicely uh, summarized. Uh, fortunately for us and our patients, the stones uh, do comprise the major cause for jaundice or blockage in the bile duct. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, as gastroenterologists and subspecialists that deal with uh, disorders of the pancreas uh, or the biliary tract and bile duct, uh, often uh, there are other causes, namely that of a pancreatic mass or cancer, uh, and that will block the bile duct. Uh, and cause the patient to turn yellow or jaundice. So you can see from this schematic uh, here uh, that this is our endoscope. This is called the echo endoscope or endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, and right in this particular schema, uh, the scope is sitting in the stomach and the pancreas lies just underneath or posterior to the stomach. So we're able to actually visualize with the endoscopic ultrasound, the entire pancreas. This would be called the body of the pancreas. This is the tail of the pancreas. And this is the head of the pancreas. We're able to visualize the pancreatic head with the scope uh, traversing through the stomach into the first part of the intestine, uh, right about so. Uh, from this orientation, we can see the bile duct going this way. Sometimes there will be a plastic stent to help drain the bile duct. Uh, if a more permanent fixture is needed or drainage, then one can place a metal stent, and we have some uh, diagrams to show that uh, later on in the uh, broadcast. Uh, but you can see very nicely in why this procedure is so useful for visualizing the pancreas. Uh, right here, we're literally millimeters away from the area of interest. Now, in this patient, we don't expect to find a mass in the pancreas, but if there were a mass in the pancreas, that's what it would look like, and we're able to do a needle biopsy um, uh, and get tissue. Okay, so let's uh, switch uh, over and have my colleague, uh, Dr. Conway, uh, demonstrate to you uh, in a patient what, what he's seeing. 
Well, thanks, Chris and John. Uh, that was a, uh, an excellent explanation of uh, both obstructive jaundice as well as the basics of endoscopic ultrasound. Um, what I'll show you today is sort of a, a basic examination uh, using the endoscopic ultrasound uh, probe. We'll be looking primarily at the pancreas, but we'll see the adjacent structures. Um, we'll be focusing on the bile duct as well, as this patient had a history of abdominal pain and elevation in the LFTs, and one of the questions is, is there anything in or obstructing her bile duct? Um, I'll start the exam where we start all of our exams, which is uh, by inserting the scope down into the stomach. We're down just at the very beginning of the stomach, right, where the esophagus, the swallowing tube, and the stomach meet. Um, the first thing that, that we see when we, when we push the, the tip of the scope against the wall of the stomach is, is the liver, and that's the structure that, that you're seeing uh, down below me or down below the, uh, the, the, the transducer. Our scopes have uh, Doppler capability, so you can see that, that uh, uh, the, the area which is uh, red is actually a blood vessel where there's flow of blood within, uh, within this blood vessel. And um, all this tissue right here where the cursor is below me is actually uh, the liver. Now we'll move on to the, to the next part of the exam where we'll, we'll look for what's called the aorta. The aorta is the major blood vessel which supplies blood to, um, to the, the, the majority of the, uh, of the body. The aorta is this uh, linear uh, anechoic or very um, dark black structure immediately beneath the transducer. And you can actually see the, the, the red of the, um, of the Doppler showing the flow of the blood within the aorta. So Jason, the U.S. is all about finding landmarks. It's, um, it's a little challenging, as you might imagine, sometimes to know exactly where you are. So we always find landmarks and follow them to other landmarks. So after I found the aorta, um, the, the thing that I look for is this structure that's immediately um, beneath the, the, the transducer here, which is the cruce of the diaphragm, uh, which lays right on top of the aorta. Right beneath that is the first artery that comes off of the aorta. Uh, after the aorta becomes abdominal, and that is what we call the, the, the celiac artery, right where the crosshair is there, a label CEL. Uh, and again, this is the aorta down here. Uh, so, Jason, this is a beautiful anatomy. Um, I think you're doing a, it's a, a great demonstration of what endoscopic ultrasound allows us to see uh, in the pancreas. Are there other areas besides the pancreas that uh, you use endoscopic ultrasound for? Sure. The, um, um, we will frequently use it at the end of the case. I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, show you uh, mediastinal views. But we can see uh, anything that is within about four or five centimeters of the, of the GI tract where we can get the transducer uh, down into is what we can see. So uh, while most of the work that we do here at Wake Forest is uh, looking at the pancreas. We can also look at the bile duct, uh, the majority of the liver. Uh, we can biopsy needles, which are in, uh, we can biopsy, I'm sorry, lymph nodes, which are, which are in the chest. Um, we can also um, insert the scope uh, into the rectum. And um, what we do there is uh, staging a lot of uh, rectal cancers. Excellent. Well, I think uh, since the million dollar question in our patient is, uh, is there a stone or is there not a stone? and what exactly is in the bile duct. Uh, can you uh, uh, answer that question for us and show us? Sure. The first thing I'm going to do is, um, is follow the celiac artery here, uh, which again is right below me, uh, to the body of the pancreas, which is now immediately beneath the transducer. And I'll, I'll zoom in on that a little bit. Uh, this tissue in here is, uh, that I'll sort of highlight with the crosshairs here, this is all the, um, this is all the the body, the, the parenchyma, the tissue of the body of the pancreas. This little, this small little dot here in the center is actually her pancreatic duct in the body of the pancreas, which is very small, about 0 0.8 millimeters. Anything less than about two centimeter, two millimeters, I'm sorry, or less is uh, is normal. Can you tell if there's been any damage to the pancreas? That's a good question. One of the one of the powers of uh, or one of the strengths of endoscopic ultrasound is our ability to gain these really high resolution images of the pancreas. And you can see while I'm showing you this pancreatic duct here, uh, you could see that uh, if this um, if there was even a very small lesion within the pancreas, uh, we'd be able to see it quite clearly. 
What we use the, the endoscopic ultrasound for a lot is uh, diagnosing um, what Grish was referring to, which is chronic pancreatitis or, or inflammation uh, in the pancreas. And there are very uh, certain characteristics that we look for, um, which are primarily caused by uh, ongoing inflammation and scarring in the pancreas. Um, this patient, um, fortunately for her, has a pretty normal appearing pancreas, actually. The, um, the parenchyma is um, quite homogeneous in that it is all um, this very typical salt and peppery echo texture. There aren't any, um, any abnormalities uh, that really stand out within, within this tissue at all. So this patient, uh, I believe her pancreas, from what I'm seeing here, certainly the body and, and the tail looks, um, looks quite normal. So uh, that was a wonderful demonstration of the uh, uh, body and tail of the pancreas. Uh, uh, Dr. Conway, can you uh, now go to the head of the pancreas because sure. that is the area uh, of interest and show us what the bile duct looks like, whether there's a mass, whether there's stones. Uh, that would be very informative for us. Sure. Um, in order for me to um, image the head of the pancreas, we have to advance the scope uh, into the duodenal bulb. So we have to advance the scope deeper into her stomach and into the duodenal bulb, which is the very first part of her small intestine. Okay, now the uh, scope has been advanced into her duodenal bulb, and uh, I think we're going to get some really nice images here. Um, let me stop, or just sort of freeze the image right here after I put the Doppler on to show everybody what we're seeing. So this is a pretty classic image of what we see when we're looking at the head of the pancreas. I use the crosshairs here to kind of demonstrate what I'm looking at. The first structure, this black or anechoic structure that's closest to the transducer, which is this sort of semicircle here at the top of the screen. This is actually the common bile duct, and this is how bile or digestive juices get from the liver down into the small intestine. Uh, right behind the bile duct is this larger anechoic structure. It's actually Doppler positive, so there's flow in this structure. This is actually the portal vein. This is how most of the blood gets into the liver. This tissue that's over in here, where the, um, where the crosshairs are now, is actually the pancreas head. And what I'll measure here is actually the pancreatic duct in the body of the pancreas. So, so Dr. Conway, are you seeing a mass in the pancreas uh, or no? What I've seen so far, this actually looks quite normal. I don't see any evidence of inflammation or chronic pancreatitis. And the brief images I've gotten of the bile duct um, look normal as well, but I've, I've just sort of just begun the exam. EUS is a very dynamic imaging modality, so it requires um, finding a structure and then maneuvering the scope. So you're scanning over the structure multiple times and in multiple planes because we're using a two-dimensional imaging um, uh, modality to image what really are, th are three-dimensional. Now, Dr. Conway, I did not see evidence of stones in your uh, bile duct on the brief, uh, uh, it, briefly in your, in your wonderful demonstration. Now, she very well could have had stones that migrated down her bile duct uh, and passed, um, so that makes a, a clinical decision challenging. Uh, did she have stones and will she form stones again and what should we do about this? Sure. What, I, what I'm trying to do now is uh, to try to get better images of, of the bile duct. And what I want to do is be sure that I examine the entire bile duct uh, from where the bile duct empties into the small intestine. And that's right where I'm looking right here. And I'll keep the Doppler on so you can see the portal vein, which is pulsating with that uh, red Doppler flow behind us. And the um, bile duct, which I'm going to try to keep right beneath the transducer, right where the crosshairs are. And as you'll see, as I torque a little bit to the right here, you can see that the bile duct and another black structure come very close together, and that's actually the pancreatic duct. So where these two ducts come together and meet right about here, this is where the two structures actually enter into the small intestine. So I know that that is the, uh, what we call the, the very most distal aspect of the bile duct. And then as I try to keep the bile duct beneath the transducer, and I, I'm torquing sort of Counterclockwise now. Dr. Conway, just by my eye from a distance, it does appear that the bile duct is slightly dilated. Uh, again, I, I'm not, I don't have the ability to measure, which you can, 
but just from looking over here, it appears to be somewhere in the six to eight millimeter range, uh, which would suggest that perhaps uh, there's some chronic obstruction and she might benefit from an ERCP with sphincterotomy. Sure, her, her, her bile duct here does measure about eight millimeters or so, which is what I'm measuring right now. Jason, um, uh, John Bailey here. Uh, sure. Some of our viewers may not be familiar with the term Doppler, or, or they may have heard sure. it on the weather forecast. Is there a storm coming, or can you tell us why we're using <laughs> Doppler as part of your test? Well, I've, I've been told that EUS images do look a lot like a, a hurricane map at times. Um, and believe me, uh, uh, it, it takes a little while to understand exactly what you're looking at. But what Doppler does is it actually measures flow. So it measures, uh, it measures flow coming uh, either towards or away from the transducer. And um, that is interpreted by the uh, processor and expressed on the screen as color. So what we're seeing here is um, flow represented by the color or the red here in the portal vein. Uh, and up above that in the bile duct where there's relatively no flow, we're seeing a Doppler negative anechoic or black structure, so there's no flow there. So again, Doppler helps us identify where there's flow in a structure and helps us uh, discriminate between what might actually be, say, in this case, the bile duct versus the portal vein. That's a very nice explanation of a, a difficult concept. Uh, one other question for you, Dr. Conway. Uh, there's a lot of interest now in the role of what we call sludge in causing uh, symptoms and uh, complaints that we used to think were due to stones. Can you tell us what bile duct sludge is and, and how you would recognize it? Sure. Bile duct sludge, this patient, of course, had her, has had her gallbladder removed, but um, gallbladder sludge um, looks like um, what we call a starry night appearance. And uh, what that is is the gallbladder, of course, being full of bile, will be a, a large uh, black sack almost on the ultrasound screen. And what you'll see within that sack are very small, sub-millimeter, uh, intensely bright or white hyperechoic um, specks, which are actually the, the, the micro crystals or these micro stones that are actually in the bile duct. So um, they're, they're very tiny. They're usually less than a millimeter in size. And because of that, they're actually frequently missed on transabdominal ultrasound images. But you could see on, uh, you could see how um, with endoscopic ultrasound, by putting the transducer very close to the gallbladder and scanning at very high frequencies, we have tremendous resolution. And something which is even sub-millimeter in size would be uh, something that we could see quite easily, actually. So what I'm doing now is just trying to get a, a complete exam of her bile duct. And, and where I am right now is, um, is up in her, up in her uh, what we call the, the liver hilum, which is where the, the bile duct um, uh, splits or, or comes together, depending on your, your perspective. What, I, what I'm seeing right here is um, this structure down in here is the bile duct and uh, wh where the crosshairs are now. And this tissue that's all behind us is the liver. So basically what I'm trying to do uh, is get images of the bile duct from all the way up here, where the bile duct is up and going up into the liver, keeping this the black structure of the bile duct again below me, which I'll keep, try to keep the crosshairs on it. And as I slowly, as I slowly torque the scope down to the right, we're following that bile duct all the way down until it empties out into the small intestine. So that, that sort of assures me that I've gotten a nice, good, thorough examination of the bile duct um, all along its length. Bile stones, of course, can be found anywhere along the bile duct. Usually they're found in the, in the bottom portion, but uh, you always want to be sure you have a nice thorough exam. And uh, that's what we're getting here, actually, a very nice thorough exam of her bile duct all the way from this part here where, we, where we're going, where the bile ducts are actually going up into the liver and then following them down as they come down with the portal vein behind it there, coming down through the head of the pancreas and then exiting out into the common bile duct. So, what, what I've seen so far is that her pancreas appears to be normal. She doesn't have any signs of chronic pancreatitis. There's certainly no masses in her pancreas. Um, her bile duct is slightly, is slightly enlarged at eight millimeters, but I don't see any evidence, uh, any obvious evidence here of stones or sludge within her bile duct. Jason, uh, we're going to thank you very much for, for the uh, tremendous commentary and your endoscopic ultrasound. You make it look very easy. It is a technically 
complicated procedure and uh, it's a, a testament to your training and your skill in this, uh, how easy you make it look. Um, so given that the patient has a, a somewhat dilated bile duct and the suspicion that she either has or recently has had stone disease, uh, it would seem reasonable to go ahead and, and do the ERCP part of the test where we, we'll uh, cannulate, as we call it, put a little plastic cannula into the bile duct, inject some contrast uh, and see what we see. And, and as part of that, we may open up the bile duct uh, and doing what we call a sphincterotomy, the, the little muscle that controls the opening of the bile duct is a sphincter and cutting that's a sphincterotomy. And uh, we'll be getting uh, up with Dr. Evans uh, my colleague who, who does the ERCP part of this test. We have a couple of questions here, uh, Girish, that uh, have come in from our viewers, and maybe I can ask you to address one or more of them. Sure. So uh, one of the questions that our viewers has asked is how often does ERCP get canceled uh, after an endoscopic ultrasound? I think that's an excellent question, and one that Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center and our own group, uh, the Digestive Health uh, Center and Section in Gastroenterology, we have specifically asked this question in a research format in a, in, from a research question. And this was recently presented by one of our fellows, Dr. Samir Charbel, uh, in Orlando, uh, won the Presidential uh, Award of Distinction as a poster. Uh, asking this question specifically. The other thing before I answer what the results of that study were uh, is that at most places, patients have to come back on two separate occasions, two different anesthesia or sedation uh, settings. At our university, at our medical center, and at Baptist, we're very fortunate uh, that uh, with the setup that we have, we can often do both procedures in the same setting and depending on what the endoscopic ultrasound exam shows, they get, the patient gets an ERCP or not. The reason we don't go straight off for the ERCP or straight to that procedure is there's a, a slight increase uh, complication risk of pancreatitis. Now that's still quite rare in our hands, but anywhere from the range of one to five percent of the time will the patient suffer pancreatitis, from pancreatitis after the ERCP, and therefore the need to try to avoid an unnecessary procedure. None of us want to uh, expose our patients to an increased risk of pancreatitis. Uh, and so with that question in mind, uh, we have uh, performed close to 200 procedures where the, the patients were consented for both procedures. And depending on what the ERCP showed, they uh, went on to an ERCP or not. And in approximately 25 to 30 percent of, uh, uh, of the time, we canceled the ERCP. So one could extrapolate and say in 25 to 28 percent of the time, we potentially avoided a more invasive procedure such as an ERCP if our patient did not need uh, that, that test done. Perhaps we could check it before we go on to the next question uh, whether they're ready for us in the ERCP room or not. Okay, we need a little more time, so we're going to take the second question, was who's a candidate for this procedure? Um, I'm going to let uh, Dr. Mishra answer who's the candidate for the uh, endoscopic ultrasound. As regards the ERCP test, uh, it is more invasive, and so we're very selective in who we do this procedure on. We do it in people who have obstruction or, of one or both of the ducts, the bile duct to the pancreas because we can do therapy and in fact over 90% of our procedures now are done for therapeutic indications which greatly reduces the risk to people who just need a diagnosis. We use non-invasive or less invasive imaging for that and now that we have ultrasound, uh, MRI scans, uh, CT scans and of course endoscopic ultrasound, we have a lot of information going in. So basically if you have obstruction of your bile ducts, you have obstructive jaundice, uh, if you have pancreatitis, if your pancreas is obstructed, you may be coming to see me or one of my colleagues for ERCP. Uh, Dr. Mishra, you want to tell us who's a candidate for endoscopic ultrasound? Sure. Thank you, uh, John. Um, we briefly touched upon this uh, when I asked uh, my colleague Dr. Conway uh, indications for endoscopic ultrasound. In the majority of cases that we perform here, uh, are 
for uh, determining uh, or evaluating the pancreas or pancreatic biliary disorders, uh, whether it's a benign condition or malignant condition, we see a lot of cancers. And originally, endoscopic ultrasound uh, was developed to stage uh, gastrointestinal cancer tumors, such as esophageal cancer, rectal cancer. Uh, as you might gather, the endoscope only allows for an endoscopic view. The beauty of endoscopic ultrasound is that at the very tip of the endoscope, there's an ultrasound device. Therefore, we can see through the wall of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, approximately five, millimeter, uh, five centimeters or so. So from the middle of the chest to the uh, area where the intestine wraps around the third portion of the duodenum, that's a significant uh, uh, area uh, around the digestive tract that we can not only see within the GI tract, uh, such as the stomach or esophagus, but through there. So things such as a small nodule or a bump, we don't know what it is endoscopically. Uh, perhaps this growth is arising from the layers underneath the superficial layer, which we can see with an endoscope. But with an endoscopic ultrasound, we can see all sorts of extra gastric diseases, uh, such as a, a growth outside the stomach or a growth within the lining of the stomach or esophagus or rectum. And certainly for esophageal cancer, for gastric cancer, for rectal cancers, it is of the utmost importance that one undergo an endoscopic ultrasound to see how far along that tumor is before they undergo surgery or chemotherapy or radiation, and certainly for benign conditions such as a stone. We can uh, almost the same accuracy as an MRI scan or a ERCP tell whether an individual has a stone, and, and Dr. Conway nicely demonstrated uh, that in this case that he didn't see a stone at that time. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the indications for endoscopic ultrasound. We've got a few more questions here. I'm going to let uh, Dr. Evans jump in when he's ready, but uh, I'm going to keep going with the questions. Uh, yeah, it, basically, between the procedures, we have a little downtime with changing the instruments, sometimes changing the patient's position, but they'll be with us shortly. Another question that came in for us was, you know, what's the success rate of these procedures? Uh, pretty high. Uh, as you can imagine, if there are anatomical problems that prevent us getting to the area of interest, uh, just beyond the stomach uh, for ELCP or the stomach, uh, any part of the GI tract for endoscopic ultrasound, that may make it difficult. And some patients have surgical rearrangements of their gut. For example, if uh, you had surgery 30 years ago for a stomach ulcer, uh, they basically uh, chopped part of the stomach out and rehooked up your intestine. And we have ways of getting around some of those things, but I would say that the, the, our inability to do these is down in the one, two, three percent range. One of the things we do a lot at, at uh, Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center is take cases from colleagues in the community who've had failures, um, and some of that is related to equipment. We have uh, state-of-the-art equipment in uh, these specialties. Uh, as I like to say to the patients, we've got more toys than, than the, the community physicians have. But there's no doubt that uh, experience is also important, and we do a, a very large volume of these cases, so um, we may be a little slicker at some of the more difficult cases than our colleagues who are maybe perhaps only doing one or two a month of these uh, in the community. I'm told uh, that we're ready to go over to the ERCP case, so uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jerry Evans, who's Assistant Professor of Medicine. Um, he recently joined us from uh, Duke University. We're delighted to have him. Uh, he has uh, the uh, admirable uh, qualification of both training in endoscopic ultrasound that you just saw and ERCP. So. Uh, Dr. Evans, I'm going to give this over to you to tell us what you're doing. All right, thanks, John. Um, so basically, we're uh, doing the exact same thing that Dr. Conway had just done. We're introducing a side viewing endoscope, uh, duod uh, otherwise known as a duodenoscope, into the stomach, and then we are going to uh, work this down into the small intestine to visualize the papilla. Right there, we're looking at the pylorus, which is the exit of the stomach, and we can localize this, or we need to localize this before we get into the small intestines. So pop right through that, and then we do a small little maneuver to try to get our way down into the sweep or the second portion of the duodenum. And What's all that up? bubbly our, stuff? The bubbly stuff is probably bile or just stomach secretions. 
here we are. Uh, those are just simply uh, stomach secretions. I mean, once we shorten our endoscope, we can visualize the papilla, which is the exit of the bile duct and the pancreatic duct right here. Um, we can then we will start getting ourselves prepared to do our ERCP, and that is uh, what I like to do first is uh, looking at our fluoroscopy. One of, well, prior to that, I like to get some images of our papilla before we do anything to it so that we can mark it for future It use. looks like this bile duct might actually be talking to you. Is it, that little it, opening, winking open and shut, or is that yeah, my I think imagination? That's it. No, I think that's it, and that's usually an unfortunate sign because it tells you that it's ready to be cannulated, and then you're so prepared to get in there quite easily, and then it, it shuts, its, shuts its door on you. Well, we have a lot of confidence in I you. No, exactly. I'm setting up for failure here rather than success. <laughs> So uh, once I get a catheter in place, what we're trying to do now is uh, I've shown you the uh, endoscopic view of the papilla. What we're going to do here is flip over our, our imaging to um, the fluoroscopic view. But we can't quite get that. We're going to try working out and getting our flora over so you can see it. Maybe I can ask you a question while you're doing that. Uh, what's different about this particular instrument that you're using to, you know, a regular endoscope that you might have like a colonoscopy with? Right. So as I was describing to you earlier that uh, the, uh, this is a side viewing duodenoscope. So this instrument is built with all of its visualization mechanics really at a, a kind of at 180 degrees really essentially from the tip. So. Our instruments, uh, as it comes out, as our visualization comes out the sides, we also have an elevator here, which you can kind of see coming out of the uh, 3 o'clock position of the endoscope. There's a little elevator that I can control from my handle endoscope that allows me to work in a different plane than the other instruments. So, you, so you're really looking at, at, at the side wall of the intestine, exactly. you're looking sideways and you're poking this little cannula out and, and you can make it move up and down. Have you got a button there or a wheel or something? I here? do have a, I have a lever on my endoscope that allows me to move the uh, elevator up and down to control my, my cannula tome. I also have uh, on this endoscope wheels that may allow me to move in a right and left position. And then I also have a second wheel which allows me to move back and forward, uh, back and away mm. from the papilla. So I can achieve um, pretty much uh, 360 degrees or at least of my visualization with any sort of maneuvers of my uh, uh, elevators, endoscope, and um, wheels. So straight down that way is the, um, is the rest of the remaining intestines. That's pretty much a straight shot. The uh, tip of our endoscope is really at the uh, 6 o'clock position of our endoscopic visualization. You look, you look like you're coming from underneath it. Is that intentional? Exactly, it is. So if you look up on the fluoroscopic view, um, my dictum as I teach fellows how to achieve cannulation is uh, the three most important things are position, position, position. So you try to get underneath the uh, papilla, aim up really in an 11 o'clock vis uh, visual orientation to the papilla. You can see I'm approaching the papilla here with my, um, okay. with my papillotome to demonstrate where I believe the orifices are. We can usually find the orifice of the common bile duct up here at the 11 o'clock position really I'm covering it with the tip of my papilla, uh, papillotome right now. I back away from the instrument and again Jerry, up Jerry, here. we're going to take a, 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 just a very brief break to answer a couple more questions here. I think they've got something technical they want to do in the room, so that will allow excitement to mount uh, getting ready for your cannulation here. So we'll okay. be back to you in a couple of minutes. I'm going to go over to Dr. Mishra who's got another hot question in his hands. Right, sure, well these are hot questions from the audience. Uh, one. Uh, viewers asking us what are the risk of uh, endoscopic ultrasound or ERCP. Um, I'll answer the EUS uh, risk first and then uh, my colleague Dr. Uh, Conway, uh, sorry Dr. Bailey here uh, will uh, address the ERCP issue. Endoscopic ultrasound for the most part poses no additional risk uh, than that of a standard upper endoscopy and these include infection, bleeding, uh, the risk of sedation uh, or anesthesia risk. Now anytime one takes a scope and inserts it into the body, there's a small risk of a, a perforation, uh, but that risk uh, is uh, extremely low, less than one in a thousand, one in two thousand. Actually for an endoscopic ultrasound, uh, that risk uh, is no greater than one in three thousand cases for a perforation. Now the pancreatitis risk 
uh, only occurs if we were to do uh, a fine needle aspiration or biopsy of a mass. And even then, the risk is less than 1%. And hopefully we'll have uh, some uh, time or opportunity to talk about fine needle aspiration or biopsying for pancreatic masses and how powerful that is uh, with endoscopic ultrasound. One of the questions that we asked is what's our success rate? Well, the success rate of actually doing the procedure is nearly 100%. Uh, the only uh, time that we're unable to uh, be successful in the procedure is if we can't get the scope down the, the patient. And that occurs for anatomical reasons. But since the seven or eight years that I've been here, I would say there's no more than seven or eight times out of thousands of procedures that we've done that we couldn't uh, get Evans, the scope yes. down. Uh, we're getting the message that we uh, can go back live to the case. So uh, we'll, we'll keep a couple of these questions for later. Uh, Dr. Evans, we're back with you, I think. All right, very good. So we've, uh, I think you can, can you see our, our fluoroscopic image now, John? Uh, not quite yet. We're get, we're, we've got the room image right now, but. Uh, we have, we, we have the fluoro image now. You do have it now. And I understand, I understand that you can rotate that image so it's more up and down, is that right? Okay. We're using a digital type of imaging, uh, which is very nice. It reduces the amount of radiation to which the patients are exposed. And we can actually control the right, left, and up, down. So we can orient this uh, image any way we want, I think. so. OK, so you've got our fluoroscopic image there. John, do you want to? demonstrate what we're looking at as the endoscope versus the, I see some clips in there as well, and, um, <clears throat> and the, you well, can see the tip of my catheter coming out there. Certainly, uh, I can describe it, uh, but the, um, yeah, we're back onto the endoscopic image here yeah. now, so uh, why don't you just go ahead and get your, yeah, we're back in the, the fluoro image, just let me take one second. The large black snake down there is the endoscope, and you can see just off looking like the leaning tower of Pisa, uh, the okay. axial spine. Uh, sort of halfway up the endoscope, you'll see a kind of white sausage area there, and that's air that's mainly in the stomach. And, and just above the, if you like, the turn in the endoscope, there are a number of little black lines that look like staples. Those are actually clips that were placed at the time of the patient's gallbladder surgery. So we would recognize this uh, fluoroscopy as indicating a patient who'd previously uh, had uh, their gallbladder out. And once Dr. Evans injects some contrast, we will see that flowing north into the bile duct, we hope. Yeah, we're just getting our, our uh, cameras set up here. You've got fluoros fluoroscopy right now, John? Uh, we're, we're back on us uh, right now. You need a few more moments? No, we're ready to go. We just want to make sure you guys have uh, the... We don't have the fluoroscopy in front of us at the moment, but we'll, I, I think it would be easiest if the fluoroscopy comes up for you just to describe it rather than, okay. rather than us. There's the fluoroscopy back. Okay. So um, if you're watching the endoscopic view, then you can see my tip of my papilla, I mean my cannula tome, right there again at the 2 o'clock, about 3 o'clock position. I'm looking at fluoroscopically to make sure I'm kind of in an upward um, um, position. I really want to start cannulating up uh, towards, not really towards the clips, but in that general direction rather than at a um, really... Can we, can we flip back onto the endoscopic view because we're only getting one at a time here, so okay. we'd probably be more interesting. There we go. We're looking at what you're doing now. So you're aiming for okay. a very small target. I'm leaving a very small target up there at the tip, and so uh, I'm now going to see what I can do about getting up there. Is so that a little guide wire poking out there? It too? is. Yep. I have very... So this looks like the space shuttle docking, and it looks like the docking may have been successful. Are we going to go back to Fluro, and well, that, actually, you, you've got a guide wire. Are you going to push that in to see where it goes? It is. We have a, a wire up there. It looks like it's actually going in the pancreatic duct. Okay. So we're going to pull our wire out. I think that winking at us was probably actually the pancreatic duct. So I'm going to try to work a little bit closer here, get up on top of it. Well, while you're doing that, Jerry, I might just address very briefly the, the issue about risks of, of this ERCP test. Um, this test has been around since uh, the 1970s, and it's been recognized from very early on that uh, the pancreas in particular can take offense to uh, being instrumented, uh, even if you're not actually in the pancreatic tube or duct, just being around it can irritate it. So. Uh, the main risk of ERCP historically has been pancreatitis. Because we now uh, avoid using it for anything really except therapy, 
uh, by using other imaging modalities. We've greatly reduced the number of patients who get pancreatitis. And we also, uh, if we keep going into the pancreatic duct, we can place a little stent in there, uh, which is a little plastic wick to ensure the drainage is preserved. So Dr. Evans is doing exactly the right thing, which is being very slow and methodical and careful to try and find the right direction and access to get into uh, this patient's balda. I think what I'm going to end up doing, I think it uh, looks like the way she's oriented is, uh, the way this patient's oriented, it appears that the pancreatic duct is the uh, predominant duct to be entered into. So what I may end up doing is trying a small little trick to allow myself to get access in the preferred duct. And that is if I can get deep access with this, this wire, I may switch to a different wire, leave that one in place, switch to a different wire, and then try to um, cannulate over that wire. I can see why he had a lot of trouble, or uh, this patient had some trouble at previous ERCP attempts. She certainly does look to be in a very favorable uh, bile duct cannulation position. However, she just does not appear to want to go into the proper duct. I would say for the audience, uh, particularly those who have never seen this before, you know, it looks like there's a lot of bleeding there, but this is grossly magnified. This is a very tiny... Uh, little nipple in the wall of the bowel and, and so what looks like a lot of blood there is actually just a, a, a very small oh, right ooze because this tissue is, is, is tender and uh, what we call friable and uh, just touching it with anything will, will make it do that. This will not cause uh, uh, the patient any problem. This is not uh, blood loss that's of any significance. So while you're doing that, uh, we're going to take a question or two. Um, the question I have here, and maybe uh, Garish, you can answer this, what's the average EUS procedure time as part of the combined approach? So what, what percentage or what time uh, would we devote to that? Well, uh, thanks again. Uh, it's, it's almost as if someone has prompted uh, our audience because, again, this question uh, was addressed and answered in our study, which uh, hopefully will uh, get published sometime soon. Uh, on average, the EUS portion added 17 minutes uh, to the entire uh, combined procedure. So uh, not a whole lot, but certainly uh, some uh, additional time was needed when we combined these uh, the two procedures. But certainly uh, 17 minutes is so uh, such uh, less uh, time compared to if the patient had to go home, come back, uh, get a driver, uh, get sedated again, and for another procedure. So we feel uh, that the 17 minutes uh, are worth uh, the investment really for the patient uh, to have this done in a combined format. All right, John, um, I don't know if you can hear me now, but to interject, uh, we have gotten ourselves into the bile duct. Dr. Dr. Evans is back on and he's indicated that uh, it's a bit like those cooking shows where, you know, they prepared it before the show and now the cookies are ready. He, uh, a miracle occurred while we weren't watching and uh, he got into the duct. But, yeah. uh, Thanks for those kind words. <laughs> Can you tell us how you did that? I'm well, sure. I think it was just a matter of getting in a better position. I was able to put a little bit more uh, uh, angle on the wire, and it was just really a matter of finding the right entry point on the papilla, making sure I was above a small fimbria. A, I might make a, a brief editorial comment that sometimes when we have failed cases that come here, this papilla looks like a boxer's ear after 15 rounds, and that's because people get a little rough and they get frustrated. So. What Dr. Evans has done is exactly the approach, which is to be very slow, methodical, careful, try different techniques. And really, you can see he hasn't traumatized this opening. So that, that's a great help for the patient, because that greatly reduces the likelihood that she will suffer uh, pancreatitis as a result. Do you have a fluoro image to show us? Yeah, well, we're about to inject for you. We're going to do this real time. So uh, we've gotten ourselves into the bile duct. I'm quite certain of that, because uh, we have the wire deep into her uh, intrahepatic ducts. And so I'm asked uh, Michelle here to go ahead and inject. And as we can see, we're filling the bile duct with this dark uh, contrast medium. And we're looking for any sort of stones or strictures or anything that might be in there that's causing her discomfort. And you can see from the cholangiogram, it actually looks very good. Um, the, uh, if you can tell where I have my cannula, my papillotome, I'm traversing up into the ducts in the area of their cystic duct. Right there where you see the tip of the um, uh, cannula, the very small dark thing just sitting right on top of the endoscope, I've put that right next to the cystic duct um, to just highlight the cystic duct, which is the uh, duct that has been um, cut and separated as the gallbladder was removed. 
Well, let me just ask you to, to share your thought process uh, in real time here. Here's a lady who had transient abnormalities of her, uh, of her liver tests, was reported to have a dilated bile duct at that time. They normalized. She previously had a cholecystectomy. It kind of sounds to me like she had a stone that she passed. And uh, your nice demonstration here uh, convinces me there's not a stone. So is there uh, any indication in your mind for opening up this duct and going trawling in it, or are you done? Well, uh, so, yeah, I'm kind of thinking about that uh, as, you, as you're talking. The presence of, so our ultrasound told us she had a slightly dilated common bile duct, and um, in that, in the setting of a dilated common bile duct with um, abnormalities of liver function tests, that takes us to an entity of sphincter OD dysfunction. The sphincter, I think, is maybe you've previously described as the type of muscle that uh, sits there at the exit of the bile duct and really guards uh, entrance of um, uh, uh, intestinal fluid and prevents it from uh, going up into the um, bile duct and keeping it somewhat sterile area. With the uh, presence of sphincter otic dysfunction, specifically type 1, we know that uh, uh, an empiric sphincterotomy will improve the presence, of, w will improve their abdominal pain um, to a, a very good degree with some long-term success. So I believe I will make a small incision here and likely will uh, look for any stones with a sweep of a, bile, uh, of a biliary balloon. We should be able to achieve this in the next couple minutes. Um, I'm not going to do a very large sphincterotomy, um, but I think it's going to be one enough so that we will be able to uh, open up her duct and relieve her for any symptoms. Can you tell us just uh, in simple terms how you're going to do this cut? Yeah, absolutely. So you see that pip the papillotome has a, a small wire there uh, that's traversing from the blue area on the endoscope down into the black uh, little band on the endoscope. And that is uh, going to be our cutting wire. We're going to use that and electrify that using electrocautery. We're going to heat that up to, a, I don't exactly know what temperature, but good enough that we're going to make a, an incision that's going to go up the, the length of this, uh, of that wire. And I'm going to aim in a certain direction that's going to be in the bulge of that um, area that is kind of lying over the wire. I do that because I know that is going to be the intraduodenal segment of the common bile duct, and I can cut up that area oh, maybe about a centimeter or so, maybe not that much, maybe a half a centimeter, uh, without causing any serious complications, including bleeding or perforation. So are we going to see like an explosion here or I flashes of light, or is it going to be noisy? No, or? it's going to be nice. And you'll see maybe a little bit of heat, a little bit of smoke, maybe a touch of blood, but uh, it should be... Um, not too uh, problematic. What I'm going to do it, is... Is the patient going to be aware of this? The patient will feel nothing of this. He'll have no idea this is going on. Um, I'm going to make a small little cut here using just pure coagulator, pure electro cut cautery, and that's just to allow this area to kind of open up a little bit. You can see a little bit of smoke. And now I'm going to change the settings on my, uh, my electro cautery, pull into the duct a little bit, express the exit portion, extra, extra duodenal portion of the ampulla, and I'm going to continue cutting in an upward fashion. Tighten. So probably one... So the, the, you're using a kind of current that, the will, that actually seals the blood vessels so they won't bleed, is that correct? That's exactly right. And you can see we've made an incision here and there is uh, no bleeding. Tighten up a that, bit. Now if you do this uh, Dr. Evans, doesn't this mean that your lunch can go up your bile duct? Uh, uh, it does not. Now, there are, it, it really does not. There are some um, issues maybe with a uh, creating very large sphincterotomies and long-term relax. Let's go ahead and sweep the balloon. So most patients don't know that they've had a sphincterotomy. They, they don't get problems from making a hole like this? They have no problems. Oh, that's so interesting. Look it looks that. like there's some sh some little particulate things coming out. It sure does. So uh, it's just stone debris. As well. Yeah, it does look like it's a little stone debris. I'm seeing if we can close in on that a little bit. But Yeah, we get quite a good view of it. Are you going to trawl this duct with some, a basket or a balloon or we something? We are going to now uh, exchange our instruments. We're going to put, well, we went ahead and came out. but. Going to put our wire back up in place. We make sure we go ahead and run the wire. All right, good. Now we're going. Just, to just to explain, uh, Jerry, or maybe you'd like to explain. You know, what, what is that debris? Is that actually a stone, or is it sludge? Or I think it was. A, I think it was a small stone, um, uh, John. To be quite, uh, uh, to be quite honest with you, I didn't. You can see large stones on the clangiogram. Sometimes you cannot mm. see smaller stones. Um, there's been a recent uh, editorial in one of our leading journals. Um, uh, gastrointestinal endoscopy uh, from a gentleman named Pat Fowl, who's up in Wisconsin, who was debating the 
ideas of impairing sphincterotomies and sweeping in patients who have very similar stories as our patient here. And the jury's really out. I mean, people sometimes feel like if they do not see stones on a clangiogram, they still feel with the indication being as high as, uh, uh, with, with the indication being certainly high, that it's worthwhile. And certainly in my experience, um, when my clinical acumen tells me that there is a stone in the bile duct, I will go ahead and do a cut and, and uh, do a sweep of the um, bile duct. And I have gotten out stones where my clangiogram did not really demonstrate those stones. We have an image on the PowerPoint of, of what an industrial strength stone would look like. Mm -hmm. So we'll just, if we can go over to that just for 30 seconds while you're getting prepared. Uh, this image here on the, the PowerPoint uh, presentation, this is, uh, I'm, with the arrow I'm showing the scope. It's the other way around to where you were seeing it on our fluoro. But this big structure here with some white in it and a little air in is the bile duct. And here is a, a faceted uh, stone uh, that has been grasped with what we call a basket. And it's a bunch of wires uh, forming a little basket and we're pulling the stones out. So sometimes these are, are very large stones and, and, and the larger stones we actually have to crush uh, with a special mechanical device before we even pull the stones out. So on a scale of one to 10 of stones, uh, what you took out would be small, but they, they can still cause plenty of symptoms. Uh, Dr. Mishra, any comments? Uh, no, I think that that's a beautiful demonstration, uh, Jerry, of um, uh, how do you make that incision. And I do feel that, you know, that the endoscopic ultrasound showed that the duct was about eight uh, millimeters, uh, which is a little bit greater in size than one would expect. Uh, and perhaps these small, uh, yeah, tiny fragments is what was causing chronic dilation. Um, and fortunately for our patient, there's no suggestion at all of any malignancy. Uh, and if we have some time, I would like to share how endoscopic ultrasound uh, is very powerful in, um, in determining what we can answer for a, a suspected mass in the pancreas. Well, Grish, let me tell you real quick, let me just uh, complete this exam because we're about done. Um, why don't you just look up on the endoscopic view real quick and we will uh, okay. blow up the balloon and show you what we're using here to sweep or duct. So that, that's a balloon catheter that you're inflating now, and so that will be inflated inside the duct, is that correct? That's and then, right. And you will pull back, and that will help trawl any junk that's out there. Okay. Correct. Yep. We're going to, if you watch on the, endoscop or the fluoroscopic view now, we're running our catheter up to where her uh, intrahepatic ducts take off. Go ahead and ask Michelle to expand the balloon. She's going to expand the balloon to the size of the ducts, and as we... Can, can we watch this on the fluoro? Can we switch over to that? So that little uh, light area up near the clips is the balloon. Yeah. And, and Michelle, our, our head nurse uh, in the ERCP room, is locking that so it stays inflated, and you're going to pull it? I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to pull it slowly through the bile duct, and Michelle is going to inject contrast on the... Uh, on the opposite wall of that balloon. So we're going to do what we call an occlusion clangiogram to make sure we didn't miss any stones. And if we pull this basket out or this balloon out and we have no stones, as we pull it out, we're going to be done with our exam. All right, just uh, as you're getting ready to do that, we're almost out of time here, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank everybody who'd been involved in putting this together. As you can imagine, this is a, a very labor-intensive uh, uh, procedure. Uh, here, here we come with the balloon now. Can we get the endoscopic view as you come out at the bottom here? Here we come. So here comes the balloon. Balloon down. And do we see anything out there? Not really. No. And normally we do this, what, a couple of times just to make sure we didn't miss anything? Exactly. Put a while back. Uh, to finish my thanks, uh, there's a whole anesthetic team um, keeping this patient uh, asleep. We have our uh, excellent endoscopy nurse and assistant team. Uh, we have all of our colleagues from who are doing the audiovisual work today and obviously our colleagues uh, who've been involved in the presentation. So we'd like to thank them all. I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to all of the questions. If you have additional questions or like information about either a self-referral or a physician referral, please use the buttons in front of you uh, on the webcast uh, and we will get back to you. Yes, John, I think uh, excellent demonstration and we really are 
uh, very fortunate uh, at our institution at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center uh, to have uh, physicians who have expertise, uh, such as yourself, Dr. Conway, uh, Dr. Evans, and myself. Uh, as uh, like anything that is worthwhile and is done right and well, it's a team approach. And having the physicians uh, who take the time to devote extra training and do a high volume, that helps. But we could not do this without the special training of our nurses who do this on a daily basis. So it's uh, that and pathology and our equipment that's available to us yep. that allows us to perform these very complex procedures on a routine daily basis and uh, we're fortunate for that. Uh, I don't know if we have some time just to, uh, do we have any uh, uh, time to address uh, another scenario in terms of malignancies of the pancreas? So uh, we sh today we demonstrated a benign condition such as stones and uh, that is what uh, I as a physician hope to find every time but unfortunately doing endoscopic ultrasound and ERCP often we're faced with malignancies uh, and what's powerful about these two techniques and technologies is uh, the patient comes to us suspecting that they have a malignancy and we're able to uh, answer that question uh, know what the cell type is and often uh, suggest how far along this tumor is. And I'm talking about endoscopic ultrasound. So if we can switch to the PowerPoint, uh, there are very uh, salient questions uh, that we ask. Uh, is this a mass? What is the mass? Uh, is it benign or malignant? Uh, does it need to be resected? And is it resectable? And often we're able to answer all these questions with endoscopic ultrasound. And our EUS, uh, sorry, our ERCP colleagues can help us uh, for palliation purposes. Uh, this is a, a, a case that was presented to us not too long ago, a young woman, a middle-aged woman with dilated ducts, weight loss, a stricture on ERCP, but a CAT scan did not show a mass. And uh, very similar to what Dr. Conway showed today, uh, you can see that uh, by endoscopic ultrasound, we did see a mass right here. Again, the CAT scan did not show a mass. So then we performed a needle biopsy. We were unable to show you that today, but we can do all this uh, via endoscopic ultrasound. And the plastic tube and stent that this patient had is right there. So within uh, minutes of this individual who we suspected had a mass, although the CAT scan did not show a mass, we did a needle biopsy and uh, we also uh, showed that the patient had some dilated ducts and on site, I think you saw this on the promo for our uh, procedure uh, that was uh, shown earlier on the webcast. This is a cytology that we put the uh, tissue that we get from the procedure right on the slide and, and outside of our room, uh, our pathologists and cytopathologists can come in and these are malignant cells. Again, our individual today, thankfully, fortunately, did not have cancer, but we are often faced uh, with patients that present as such. Just before we wrap this up and we really uh, are done now, um, one last question that was a very good question is how long does it take to recover from these procedures? Uh, and the answer is pretty quick, uh, particularly with anesthesia, it wears off uh, quickly. We have to keep the patients about half an hour legally uh, and, and medically to make sure they're awake. Uh, but almost all of our patients who are outpatients go home uh, the same day. Uh, they can't drive the same day, but they can do their other activities. And uh, people are pretty satisfied with this kind of sedation. So I'm going to thank uh, my colleague, uh, Girish Mishra. Uh, again, thanks to the whole team and uh, special thanks to you for, for watching. Thank you again. Thank you for watching this presentation of a live endoscopic ultrasonography and endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography from Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. OR Live makes it easy for you to learn more. Just click on the Request Information button on your webcast screen and open the door to informed medical care.